Uh, I'm Jeff Hawkins, and I'm going to be introducing the panel and the moderator tonight. And uh, I think I was asked to do this partly because uh, I worked at Grid for 10 years. Uh, I joined the company right before the first laptop was launched. But seeing the audience tonight here and meeting with a lot of old friends, that's not a very unique uh, qualification for being up here tonight. Uh, I'm also uh, a, big, a big fan and supporter of the Computer History Museum. And so I'm going to just tell you a few words about the museum, in case you're not familiar with it, and tell you a few personal stories about, uh, about Grid. And then I'll turn it over to our panel and introduce them and the moderator. Uh, first of all, if you don't know, uh, you're in the Computer History Museum. Hopefully you know that by now. And uh, this is a museum in the making. And uh, I was surprised just talking to people downstairs how many people have not even uh, gone through the exhibits I have here today. You really have to do that. But this is, uh, this, this is going to be a really world-class museum. It's, uh, it's already a world-class um, uh, uh, entity, but uh, the exhibits are going to become much more. So what you have now is sort of a work in progress. Um, it is the world's largest collection of computer artifacts, and uh, it's also this place where they're archiving and documenting about the history and the you know, creation and the history of computing. And it's really amazing we can do that now because many of the people who have, were real leaders in this field are still alive. And tonight's event is part of that. It's part of the archival process. Uh, <laughs> that, that, did I, I didn't imply that this was about, you know, that anyone's about to... Kick the bucket here any moment now. Um, I, I do think this is a very important institution, and for two reasons. One's a local reason. You know, when people come to Silicon Valley, they say, where is it? What do I do? You know, you can tell them to drive down, you know, uh, one of the, the roads here and look at knock up buildings. But, you know, really, this is going to become a destination, and I'm certain of that. And people from all around the world are already coming here, and this is where people are going to go to learn about the, the history of this. But I also think it, it, it's, a, it's a remarkable institution because um, this computer revolution is something that is really a quite historic uh, 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 significance. Hundreds of years from now, hopefully thousands of years from now, we'll still be here, um, people will look back at this time in the same way we talk about the Renaissance or things like that. And, and being able to have a clear history of it and have archived of the people who are there will be really a fantastic resource. And I'm a big supporter of the museum. Uh, if you don't know, you can get involved in many ways. You can volunteer. You can donate equipment. Um, you can visit. If you haven't done it, bring friends and, friends and family. And you can offer financial support. Any and all of those are welcome. Uh, talking about financial support, uh, I do need to mention that tonight uh, is part of this Odyssey and Technology series, and there is a very generous donor who has provided the funds for that. That's Sun Labs. And if you don't mind, I would appreciate you just joining me with a little brief applause, thanking him for their support of this. Okay, I'm going to, uh, I'm not on the panel, but I'm going to take this oppor podium opportunity to tell you three personal stories about Grid uh, that maybe you'll find interesting. Uh, these are not technology stories. One is about positioning. These are some lessons I learned. Um, the, the idea is that when you position a product, when you f what you first says, say about it sticks for a long period of time. And one of the remarkable things about the first uh, laptop, the Grid Compass, was its price. It was $8,150, which is a very odd price. First of all, it's very expensive. We're talking about $1,982. So it might be like $25,000 today or something like that. You could buy the car. You could get the laptop, you know. And, um, but it was also a very memorable price. I don't know why they came up with that price. Perhaps one of our panelists knows the answer to this question. But it stuck. And so from then on, people remember Grid as the company that made expensive laptops. It didn't matter if we sold the cheapest laptop, the you know, much less expensive later on. Everyone was like, oh, yeah, they make the expensive laptops. Um, that was, and, and the flip side of that was that the very first products were made with magnesium cases, which was very cool and sexy. And uh, we said they were rugged. I don't really know if they were rugged at all. In fact, um, <laughs> There's some evidence that they weren't that rugged, but um, <laughs> clearly later on we made plastic products that were no more rugged than anybody else's products, but everyone says, oh, you guys make those rugged computers. And you say, oh, yep, that's right, the expensive rugged computers. <laughs> and when you add those two together, you won't be surprised one of our best customers was the U.S. government. They like to spend money and they like rugged. So we sold a lot to the Department of Defense and other spooky agencies like the NSA and so on. Um, the second thing is, is something about technology adoption. Uh, it's an amazing fact. We had this product. It was designed for business executives. And the, the biggest obstacle, one of the biggest obstacles we had for, for selling the product was the fact, believe it or not, it had a keyboard. And I was in sales and marketing, and I saw this firsthand. At that time, 1982, 
business people who were in their 40s and 50s and so on uh, did not have any kind of computer or keyboard in their office. And it was associated with being part of the secretarial pool or the word processing, remember that industry? The word processing department. And so you'd put this thing in their office and say, get that out of here. You know, it's like getting a demotion. And they, they really were uncomfortable with it. The second reason they were uncomfortable with it is because none of them knew how to type. And it, it, it wasn't like they said, oh, well, I'll have to learn how to type. They were very afraid. I saw this firsthand. Uh, they were very afraid of appearing inept. Like, you know, you're giving me this thing, I'm going to push the long keys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fail. I'm going to try to type something. It wasn't. And we couldn't solve this problem. It actually took a generational change uh, for the next just younger group who had been exposed to uh, terminals and computers to grow into that. So that was an amazing sort of technology adoption problem that you would have never thought about. And my third story has to do with invention. Um, and uh, this, the, the great laptop really was an invention. It was a, a solid invention. I mean, no one had done a product like this before. And uh, it was a sort of remarkable product in many ways. But they actually got a patent on the, the laptop. And this patent was one that essentially covered the idea of a display, a flat panel display that folded, hinged over the keyboard. Now, in the beginning, this patent wasn't very valuable because, well, Good was the only one making products like this. But some years later, some lawyer found this in a closet someplace and said, hey, this could be valuable. And so they went out and they started basically licensing it to other laptop manufacturers, and they started collecting significant royalties on this. Now, regardless of how you feel about patents, it's still an interesting story. Um, so they were making millions of dollars off of this. And then to, one of these licensees said, wait a second. They looked at the patent, and they challenged it in court. And the reason they challenged it is because the patent read that the hinge was substantially towards the rear. That is, the hinge between the lid and the, the computer was substantially towards the rear. When you look at the compass, you'll see that it was sort of in the middle towards the back. And, um, and they challenged that at that point, all the hinges were at the rear of the computer. They said, well, substantially towards the rear isn't the rear. And, um, and they won. And that patent, that patent became useless. And I think the amusing part of the story is I doubt, I doubt very much that anyone, when they put that word in there substantially, ever thought about it. Uh, but it cost probably tens of millions of dollars on someone's just, it's a lesson I've learned in patents. Okay, those are my three stories. Uh, let me just introduce the panel briefly here. These, are, uh, these people are all, um, Great uh, computer pioneers. They're all very much involved in the original design of the, uh, of the, of the Compass, the laptop. Um, we have, uh, skipping the moderator for the moment, we have Glenn Edens, who is, I believe, the vice president of engineering. Uh, then Carol Hankins, who was in charge of all the software. I worked for her for a number of years. Uh, down at the end is Dave Paulson, who was in charge of hardware and uh, electrical stuff. And then um, <laughs> Craig Mathias, uh, second from the end. Craig worked on something which probably no one ever heard of called uh, the Grid Central. Grid Central? Yeah, Grid Central. And uh, Grid Central was like the early version of the internet. It was like all these laptop computers were going to be connecting uh, through the telephone system at 1200 baud, an amazing speed at that time. Um, and this was like, it became this seamless, you had a seamless integration to this server out there when your files could be on either place. It was a very, very cool idea that was really, really slow. Um, <laughs> But, but Craig was involved in that. Our moderator tonight, we're very privileged to have John Markoff, who probably does not need an introduction. Uh, John has been writing about this industry for many, many years, uh, the last 18 or so, I think, at the New York Times. He covers Silicon Valley, uh, computers and technology, has an interest in the culture of this. He's uh, written numerous books. His recent one came out last year, and you have to, excuse me, John, we're going to have to read the title because it's quite long. He said, uh, What the Dormouse Said, How the 60s Counterculture Shaped the Personal Computer. He's a, he's a fascinating guy. I have no idea what he's going to ask these people tonight, but please uh, join me in welcoming the grid panel. Let's see, can you all hear me? Yeah, good, it's working. Um, I'll stay away from that. So this, this is, uh, is going to be fun. Um, we're going to explore the design and the engineering of the first laptop computer uh, tonight. I, we've got two of the three founders. John Ellenby, I guess, is traveling, um, but we have uh, the heart of the engineering team. And, uh, you know, I was at InfoWorld in the early 1980s, and I, to be perfectly honest, suffered from grid lust. And I actually called my old boss today, John Dvorak, because, you know, I saw a lot of computers come through uh, uh, InfoWorld for review, and I didn't remember the grid coming through InfoWorld. And uh, Dvorak insists that it did, and I suspect that he actually copped it when it came through, and that's why, <laughs> why we, we don't have it. Um, stranger things happen at InfoWorld. Um, 
So, you know, I think of the grid as the missing link between things that were done uh, with large computer systems in the 60s and 70s and the personal computer industry, which emerged in the 80s and 90s. I mean, it was more than portability. Um, you know, the, the personal computer industry, which I believe John Doerr once described as the largest legal accumulation of wealth in history. He, he later said that about the Internet, but he said it about personal computing first, I think. Um, but uh, the, the thing that I think is really striking that I hope we can explore today is that the grid was as interesting inside as it was outside. There were lots and lots of firsts in a computer that emerged at a time that we were just starting to use uh, uh, Microsoft DOS, or perhaps if we were really hip, we were using CPM. Um, this had, uh, you know, this was a, a computer that had a multitasking operating system. Uh, it had a, a, a graphical uh, operating system. It, it had, um, it had advanced memory management, and it had a network file system, which you know we're still sort of trying to stagger through toward today, I guess, in the rest of the computer industry. Um, I, have, I only have one story. And uh, it's about a grid user that I think, um, you know, we, there have been uh, references to spooky people who use grids and things like that. And apparently there are some great stories. But um, a couple of years ago, um, I discovered that one of the um, hardcore grid users was a man by the name of Admiral John Poindexter, um, who uh, got a grid while he was uh, the national security advisor. And um, uh, he would take his grid with him with uh, President Reagan when Reagan would spend his weekends uh, on the ranch in Santa Barbara. Well, it turns out that Admiral Poindexter was and still is a hacker. And what he liked to do with his grid, because he had access to a satellite phone and I guess to some sort of IBM mainframe back in, uh, in Washington, D.C., in the White House, in the executive office building, he would hack on the prof system on the weekends while he was on the, on the Reagan uh, ranch. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I've heard that there are even more interesting uh, uh, grid customers, and maybe we'll, we'll learn about uh, some of those. Um, so I will um, uh, lead a, a panel for about a half an hour. But first, um, Glenn Edens, who is uh, now um, a senior vice president for consumer electronics. That's a brand new title, so congratulations at Sun. And uh, was one of the founders of Grid, is going to sort of start us off with a, a, a short presentation about the history of the computer. Is there any way to dim the, the spotlights for a second? Uh, so thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm going to do this really fast because I want to get to the talking part. But the, the object here was a lot of you may not remember this, <laughs> either because you were there and you forgot, <laughs> or you weren't. Um, so uh, a little bit of quick history. Uh, John Allenby left his cushy job at Xerox Park. Uh, in January of 1979 uh, to uh, look at starting a company. Uh, I got involved uh, later that year, and, and Dave Paulson got involved in, in um, November or so. In, in December, we had written uh, our first business plan with the help of Ray Williams and, and, and other folks. And Gene and, and Ray are here in the front row. Gene Amdahl was one of, and Ray were some of our first seed investors. Uh, in August, we actually moved out of the garage and got into a building, and we were, a, we were one of Silicon Valley's first stealth companies, uh, and we didn't go public with anything. Most applicants that were interviewing for jobs didn't even find out what they were going to be working on until after they said yes, which was a trick you could pull in those days. Um, Bill Mogridge got involved. Uh, we were, of course, inspired uh, many People deserve credit, uh, but we were all inspired by Alan Kay's vision of a Dynabook. John's idea for starting the company was at first to do a portable electronic email terminal, and that was inspired by John watching John Ellenby watching John Shock put on a million miles back when that was hard, uh, running around with this big Texas Instrument printer terminal. So when I got involved, the, the contribution I made to the startup was to really push that we should do a whole computer, which was kind of interesting. So uh, Bill Mogridge uh, got involved and, and got his felt pins out and started to, to set about to work. Uh, we showed that idea and concept to David. Uh, David shook his head, but he got his TTL data book out. 
We had this model that Bill Mugridge built. Uh, you notice it's a very different form factor than what we got to. Uh, we showed that to a lot of investors, and we were able to raise money. Uh, I'm going to step through these really quickly. This was the original brochure, so to remind everyone what the machine looked like, and we have a few here. Uh, one of the other interesting things is we did two servers. Most people don't remember this. We had the grid uh, central, which was this large mainframe uh, that we ran in, in Mountain View, but we also sold a departmental server, uh, which had storage and tape backup. So that was pretty unusual in that day. The other unusual thing is the original grid had audio. We had a full telephone with a handset uh, and a speaker. So we were uh, probably way ahead on the audio front. We say it's likely the first laptop because there were many machines and lots of ideas floating around. Uh, if you look at some of these photographs, they're great. They're the, the manufacturing process. Got to remember this was 80, 81. We actually manufactured the unit here in Mountain View. So some of these photographs. Uh, are of that process. Uh, the grid sign there just serves a quick story. Uh, that sign is made out of concrete. It's about five feet tall. It's big. When Sun took over these buildings, uh, they were very frustrated because it cost them $300,000 to take the thing away. <laughs> um, I won't go through all these specs, but, but you can see this was everything that was crammed into the machine. Uh, serial ports, a full 16-bit processor. We went straight to the 8086. Memory, bubble memory. We used GPIB, which was the HP uh, test pro uh, uh, bus for the, the interface. Um, so that was how we hooked peripherals to it. Um, whoops, hello. Yes, Jack is there. Uh, I wish I had some better pictures for the software. Uh, we couldn't really find any screenshots, so these are out of an old user manual. They're kind of ratty. Two interesting things. We were doing compound documents. Carol and her team wrote an amazing amount of software. So we were doing compound documents in 81, uh, and we had a full integrated suite. So relational database, graphics, text editing, communications, uh, it was an amazing set of software. Uh, as uh, John mentioned earlier, multitasking OS, and it all fit in 256K. <laughs> Bill, are you listening? <laughs> uh, Grid Central was the big server in the sky. We were doing software downloads for updates over the phone. We could do maintenance. Uh, we ran a little email service, and you could also buy a uh, Compass Central, which was basically a server that could support 32 machines uh, through a little weird uh, local area network. It was a lot like Apple Talk. Uh, we did get some patents. Uh, Jeff mentioned those. A uh, little bit of correction, though. On appeal, through a law firm, Townsend & Townsend, the grid patent uh, did get reinstated, and it did collect royalties till its dying day. Uh, one of the most exciting things for all of us was when we got the grid on the shuttle. And that was a pretty big project. NASA had never put a piece of consumer equipment on the shuttle except for Tang. <laughs> so we were the second thing uh, that was bought off the shelf. Uh, one real quick story. We had to put a fan in the grid, and if everyone remembers, the original grid didn't have a fan. It made no noise. But in space, conduction doesn't work. So that was kind of amazing. So here are some shots of, of happy astronauts using the machine. Whoops, this thing is being slow today. Hello, hello. Uh, this was our first brochure. We were kind of obsessed with briefcases. Uh, this will come back in a minute. Uh, this brochure was kind of cute. It opened it up. And, and also to uh, Jeff's comments, that photograph was part of our whole process because we knew we had to teach executives that they could actually have a computer on their desk uh, and it wasn't a typewriter. Um, this was our first uh, public real uh, article which came out in, in April of, of 82. Uh, this was another one of those things which kind of, I think, hurt us. It stuck with us, the Porsche for top executives. Not sure that's really the label that, that we ultimately wanted, but it served us well at the time. 
And uh, we, we got listed in uh, December of 82, is that? We got uh, product of the year in Fortune magazine. Uh, and, and that is a Timex Sinclair, which I thought was really cool because you had a $99 computer next to a $9,000 computer. <laughs> And just a few quick ones here. Uh, this one, there is a very young Bill Mugridge. Uh, this article was a, a great piece about the design process we went through. And one of the other really fun honors uh, that we got was we got selected uh, in uh, the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which was kind of cool. We, we beat Steve into the museum. Uh, and then how did it end? Well, Tandy bought us in 88. Uh, that was actually the grid convertible product, which has been reintroduced by Microsoft as the tablet PC. <laughs> that is uh, John Ellenby, who, who gives his regards. John couldn't be here tonight because he had to be in Japan. Uh, the other important thing is that is the original briefcase that the grid was carried in, the models were carried in, and all the VCs uh, got to see. Uh, it's been on the bottom of his boat, so it's a little moldy. And then lastly, a little bit of a serious thing, there was a really amazing set of people that worked at GRID. That was one of the most fun things about it. We had an amazing time together. Uh, there was a, a couple really great individuals who have passed on, uh, Bill Calvert, uh, Steve Hobson, uh, Steve Holtzman, Bill Kling, and Joe Mellison. And just, uh, we really give our respects to those folks because they all made incredible contributions as well. And that's it. Thank you. That was perfect. So let me start by um, asking uh, Carol, Craig, and Dave to just say a couple sentences about what your individual roles were uh, at GRID. Uh, Carol, you're now a development manager at, at Palm? Um, actually, I'm a process uh, uh, engineer at Palm. Okay. And um, yeah, I was hired in to um, uh, actually work for Joe Mallison, one of the fellows who passed away that uh, Glenn mentioned. And um, he was going to lead up all the software development effort. And uh, Joe um, passed away about 72 hours before my first day. So um, anyway, I ended up uh, going in and um, uh, hiring uh, most of the software people. And were you at Xerox immediately before? Uh, no, I was at Zilog for about a year before I was at, uh, at uh, Grid, but before that I was at Xerox. I was at Park for about seven years. Okay. Which group at Park did you work with? Um, well, I was actually at Park. I did um, speech recognition for a while, um, and then I moved over into SDD and we developed the STAR. Okay. So I did some microcode. and okay. I d We actually worked on Bravo, so <laughs> don't ask me any Bravo questions. <laughs> Craig, what was, what was your role? Uh, I was originally hired to work on the operating system. Carol hired me. Uh, we had looked at uh, other operating systems and decided we were going to actually build our own. And I guess we'll be talking more about that shortly. And I got about two months into it, and we'd been talking about the load center, which became Grid Central. So there was all this load center, this load center, that. And somebody realized one day that we didn't actually have anybody working on that. So <laughs> I, I was uh, made manager of the load center project, and that later turned into something called the network products group, and we did all of the communications and networking stuff. OK. And Dave, what, what was your role? Uh, trying to keep Glenn honest mostly. So. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk more about that later. Yeah. So, but, uh, basically, came on board to uh, uh, left a little place called Apple Computer, uh, actually before they went public. And uh, but it was, Grid was such an interesting place to go do, and John was such an interesting guy. And I'd worked with Glenn for a couple jobs, and so. Uh, it was just, you know, this opportunity to go do something that was basically completely unheard of and, and practically impossible at the time. So, um, and putting all this interesting technology together in a box and, and make it work. So, and, and your lineage at Apple, two, three, Lisa. What, what did you? Work on? Uh, actually, came in there to work at Lisa, and okay. so it was there actually not very long. It was just, you know, it was one of these things where things just lined up, and yeah. Grid was such an interesting thing to go do. So. Well, let's start by, uh, you mentioned briefly that uh, the grid was inspired by the Dynabook, and I wanted to sort of drill into that a little bit. I noticed that you had a prototype there that was not a clamshell, 
And I went back and looked at the, um, you know, a lot of those Alan Kay images, and it looked very much like my image of one generation of the Dynabook. So, you know, did you all uh, sort of have the Dynabook in mind when you were designing? Um, or was, I mean, how much was it an inspiration? I think mostly we had half of John's briefcase in mind when we were doing right. it. You know, it was just, it As was in like, to fit in? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that, that, I mean, that was the rule. Yeah. It, it, whatever That's we built it. had to fit in half of John Allenby's briefcase. It we could choose the, the half. half. The left half, Not the right half. Something, but, but that was yeah. the rule. Okay. And I think Carol and I were the only ones who had a lot of exposure to the Xerox stuff. At, well, and John. Um, I think, you know, the notion that you could create a portable computer that could be a standalone device, that part was inspired by Alan's personal dynamic media paper and okay. you know, some of the discussions we had had at Xerox. But the, the, the uh, you know, the focus, the market focus, um, well, first of all, let me ask you, where did 8150 come? Was that, was that a correct number, and th is there a story? I have no idea. Do you that was Paul Hamill's fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, where's, where's Hamill? <laughs> this was back in the day where we should have forward priced it, and, and we didn't, we weren't that smart. Um, you, you got to list price by figuring out what your cost of goods was and what your margin needed to be, and so it was really a bottom-up number. Okay. So there was very little. I mean, we knew it had to be less than 10 grand. Right. <laughs> it was basically 3x the bill of materials. Of yeah, exactly. Was. But how much was the, the briefcase a metaphor for a business a business tool, a business or a businessman's tool, or a you know was that was the you guys were not thinking as broadly as the original Dynabook as being this generalized yeah. information tool. That was not on the... It would have been almost impossible to build something like that in that time. It wasn't like we set out to build something expensive. But, you know, the, the original display that we were going to use was a vacuum fluorescent blue display. That's where the blue logo came from originally. And then you notice the logo is gold. And that's because we switched to an electroluminescent panel. Those cost about $860 a piece. Yeah. You know, and Sharp was building them, and we bought all they could make. They simply weren't in volume manufacture. And so, that, Glenn, that was to your point that you sort of drove the creation of the flat panel. I mean, is that fair to say? We, we had a lot to do with getting five Japanese companies excited. Um, John and I went there with the model. Uh, got Dr. Okano at Sharp to really commit, because Sharp wasn't sure they wanted to put the display in production. They were doing a couple prototypes. They were actually trying to invent a wall paint that would glow to replace light bulbs. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's the truth. They maybe they should have done that too. Um, we, we found that display purely by accident, yeah. flipping through a Japanese electronics magazine. Yeah. And now, LCD displays were around. They were in. No, they were well, not around. No. There was character displays. Okay. And there were LCDs that were custom designed. There, there was very few, if any, at the time I don't think we found any bitmap LCD okay. displays. And they were so, terrible anyway. They yeah. only had a two to one contrast yeah. ratio. Yeah. So on a good day you might be able to see it. The, the, one I, the one I remember is the four line display the next year in the Radio Shack Model the 100. Sandy 100. Was, that the, was that an early? Th that was, that was early, a character display. It was not a bitmap? That was not fully bitmap because okay. there was separation between right. The, the character cells, okay. and that machine came out in, was it 83 or 84? 83, I think. It was 83. Yeah, okay. it was just downstairs, I think it was 83. Yeah. And it was sort of the polar opposite of, of, uh, of your guy's machine in a way. I mean, it was the, op it was the absolute Volkswagen of, of computing for, for a Porsche Volkswagen. It was um, almost consumer yeah. electronics versus we were building a business tool. Yeah. We, we were building a PC. Okay. And so how did you stumble across the national security market? Did they come to you, or did you go to them? Well, we can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about it? Actually, there is, there is, there is a funny story. We, we were at Freedom Circle, which was our first building that we were in for about, I don't know, nine months until we moved over to uh, Garcia Way. Uh, there's a funny story about that, too, if, if we remember. Um, there was this business at Freedom Circle, which we later discovered was the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> and that was How really convenient. an accident. <laughs> that, that was totally an accident. Um, the, and so folks would go in there, and they had these little mailbox, and they would drop things off, and they would pick things up. And remember, we were sitting out there one day at lunch watching all these strange, well-dressed <laughs> characters come in with big bulges <laughs> under their pockets, <laughs> which we assumed were guns. Um, the, the military 
there was a uh, one of our early marketing folks was Bill Gable, who came from the military industry. So he had a lot of links uh, into that, and our rugged thing did take off. Okay. I mean that well, metaphor. And I think one of the one of the big things was the White House Communications Agency. Uh, interesting group of guys who basically were charged with going out and finding the latest and greatest technology basically to support the White House and so one day this colonel comes in Jim Offer and says you know we want to look at your computer and you know it sort of blossomed from there but it was you know it was a really interesting thing to go do because one it just it got us in at the very highest levels, I think, within the government, and it sort of then filtered down from yeah, that. Yeah, and once that side. happened, then it had to get, you had to basically, it had to start uh, turning it into a Tempest machine. Which so, we did. Which we did. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't really care how much it radiated as long as you didn't understand what it radiated, and that was their whole objective. <laughs> so, you know, I, it, you know, it could have it. blanked your TV and they wouldn't have cared, but you couldn't figure out what was being typed on the keyboard. Yeah. So It turns out with a ventless case made out of solid magnesium, it didn't radiate very much. So, okay. uh, I, it, It's interesting because that was right about the time since the issue of, of FAA and in-flight uh, cellular phones has come up again. It was 81, uh, 82 when the issue of having an electronic device on a plane and interference came up for the first time. You guys would have been okay using it on an airplane. We didn't have a actually battery, not. so we were fine. <laughs> actually not. It ran on AC power. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> right. No, we, we didn't get the first battery machine until 84, I think okay. it was. Okay. Or 83. I think it was 85, wasn't the, was it the grid case was Around the first then. battery. Well, we had batteries in our first one. Wow. We <laughs> run about five minutes. We, yeah, we yeah. actually <laughs> ran it. We ran it off an inverter, you know, a small inverter, and so that was very impressive That's for demos. But impressive. There was one other thing about military that I want to come back to really quick. What we discovered quickly, you know, you follow the money. At 8150, the military thought it was a bargain. They thought it was disposable. <laughs> In, in some cases, it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you have that? Well, so um, one of the great returns that we had, actually, Paul Hamill um, did a great presentation. Um, at that time, I think he was managing the, um, uh, the customer support group. And uh, so we had a, a peripheral for the, for the compass that was a small floppy disk. It, well, small, five and a quarter inch floppy disk. But it was, you know, about this big. I like that. And... Um, so Paul was, uh, I guess he, one of one had been returned, and so Paul kind of, you know, had it behind his back or something, and called the whole uh, support center in to uh, to talk to him about, you know, you've got to do a lot better job screening calls, you know, and you have to ask people when they uh, when they call, you know, what's wrong with the unit, what seems to be the problem you have, and just t just chastising them for not doing a great job about, you know, returns and warranties and stuff, and. And he flips out this, this uh, we called it a chip, I think. Yeah. He flipped out this chip, and it had a bullet hole right through the center of it. <laughs> now, there are, there are a couple of plausible explanations. That could have either been, you know, enemy action, or it could have been an irate customer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're not, we're well, not sure. Yeah. We were but, led to believe that the agent did not die. <laughs> yes. But did my, we, did, we, we did have kind of a joke because of the, the compass had bubble memory, and that was the, kind of the only onboard storage. And there were, were there three of them? Three of them. Three, three of them yeah. in there, 320, 328 gigs. Yep. And so, uh, so when we talked about the NSA and various other agencies that had these things, they were worried about, you know, gosh, what if somebody were to attack them? You know, they, then somebody could get this machine that would have all their classified data in it. And it was like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? And so we laughed, and we said, well, you know, you could just put, like, little X's on the box. You know, you could just shoot it. Um, <laughs> that was one thing. But, but we ended up writing a, some software for them to actually erase the bubble in an emergency, and we, we called it the scrubbing bubbles. <laughs> so that's right. This is where you've ever, all the league got If you've ever set magnesium on fire, that was a good way to do it. Yeah. So, yeah. My, my favorite government story was Glenn comes into my office one day around 5 o'clock, and he says, pack your bags. And I pack my bags? He says, pack your bags. Where am I going? Washington. When? Tonight. Said, what am I doing? You're making a sales call tomorrow. And I think Alan Lefkoff was on that sales call. Did, we, did you go with me to Washington on that one? I think you did. Um, anyway, it turns out we're going to the IRS, you know, and, and like most people, I don't want to get, even know about the IRS, let alone go make a sales call on them, but, you know, after all the jet lag and lots of coffee, we got the deal, so they didn't care about the price either. <laughs>
So they would get it back. But before we go too far, I want to ask you about the roots of the clamshell design. Where did the clamshell idea come from? I know Bill Mortgage is here, but if one of you guys know the story, why a clamshell as opposed to the first prototype, which was not? I don't, you know, we went through just a lot of different variations of it. And, you know, I think it was just sort of a natural evolution of trying to protect everything when it was in a traveling situation. So, you know, it just really was, it was sort of the right result to the whole thing. There was another reason, which was quite personal for me, which is the unit that laid flat. I, you know, my eyesight ends at my nose, which most people know. I couldn't use that one because I couldn't bend over enough to get to it. So the clamshell for me was a lot better because I could, you know, get to here like that. So that had something to do with it. But we ran through gazillions of designs. I don't know if Bill still has the notebooks. There was a lot, you would not believe how many form factors you could come up with. So actually, I think, too, it was the idea that Bill liked the most because Bill had this great trick, right? He'd do like 30 or 40 different line drawings of something that he wanted, you know, and he'd bring them all to you. And you'd finally get to one that was just really beautifully colored. What do you think about this one? That was the one he wanted. So did the magnesium ever, any examples of magnesium catching fire? Were you just talking hypothetically? No, although actually some of the spook guys actually talked about bringing a satchel charge along with them because they knew that if they got magnesium, it's very hard to ignite. But if you get it ignited, it won't stop. So, I mean, it really was one of their strategies for how you destroy these things if you're, you know, if you're in a covert activity and need to get rid of it. And did you look at plastic and aluminum, too? Were they candidates for design materials? And why did you pick magnesium? Wait. Plastic was going to be kind of tough, and we did want ruggedness. We were pretty rugged. I mean, there was a funny story on our very first press release. I was, had just done a, showing the machine, and it was a setup like this with a podium over there. I had stepped down, and my foot caught the extension cord, and I just whipped the thing off the podium, six feet up the stage, hit the concrete. Top came slamming down. Top came slamming down. Picked it up. It still worked. And we then made it look like that was all part of the pitch. <laughs> it was like a Timex commercial. It was unbelievable. But that was, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call that rugged. I mean, there was things that it could survive and things it couldn't. The magnesium was a material that you could do good design work in. Aluminum, you just couldn't get any good lines out of it. Um, plastic, we didn't want to use for heat because we wanted conduction because that was part of the it will have no fans school. Yeah. It's but that was, you know, that was very expensive as well. I don't know if you know this, but when you die cast the magnesium, there's pieces that have to be machined off. You have to machine it underwater. underwater. So we actually went down and watched the guys do this. Big guys yeah. in hip, hip waders, you know, with machine tools underwater making our parts. <laughs> Where was this? Where did they make your Spartan medals? Okay. In um, St. Louis, I think it was. Tennessee. Bill Hamill would remember. And... Wasn't the first next case magnesium? Yeah. He was a copycat. He was good. Was, was that a... <laughs> <laughs> next was my next job. <laughs> that was your next job? Yeah, that was my next job. Did you take the magnesium meme with you to... Uh... No, I think Steve was just always envious of the magnesium case, and, you know, it was kind of really cool stuff, so... Yeah. You know, there's some... Uh, you guys... Uh, nobody cares about this, but uh, there's some... Uh, you know, the bicycle industry has gone from, from titanium to carbon fiber, and they believe their next material is magnesium. So you, were, you made just great stuff. Way ahead, of the, way ahead of the curve. So um, in terms of Silicon Valley companies, um, the, the grid cultures that built up, what company was it like? I mean, if you guys had that, you guys have all been around the valley a long time, and what was our culture? I, I think it was unique. I had not seen any companies like that. The, the, everybody came from such different disciplines. You know, there were, I came from Data General, which you may recall was, uh, they built ugly computers that worked really well, but it was a blood and gut sales culture. I was in systems engineering and systems engineering management there. So I was just, you know, how are we going to sell this thing, you know, and, and all of that. And we had a lot of people who were just brilliant technical people uh, working on this. I, I don't think I've ever seen a team like this in any other company I've been associated with or any anyone that has been a client of mine. Over the years, it's really it was a unique experience. And, and one of the things about the software team that we had, um, you know, we, uh, John and, and Glenn and I all had um, a lot of Xerox experience. 
And uh, John was very adamant uh, in, uh, that we really wanted software, people with software engineering skills. Uh, and so, you know, we started with, uh, we have had a number of people from HP and then some of the people from Zilog and, you know, things like that. And um, also when we hired in people, we ended up having them work on something that they had never really worked on before. So like, um, you know, Michael Tibbet came in and Michael was writing a text editor. Well, isn't that special? Peter Alley came in, he was working on um, a, um, you know, database. And the great thing was, was that there was, there was a lot of expertise that, um, uh, that the team had, you know, sort of in other people's areas. And um, so it became a pretty collaborative effort. I mean, it was collaborative part also because they kind of sat in a pretty big open area, but um, I, I think the culture from the, it was very engineering, software engineering oriented, very very practical. And actually, um, Sam Wiegand, there was a time, uh, Sam was our, uh, he'd been a VP sales. of development, uh, or right, VP, VP of sales. And um, one of the things that Sam uh, said, there was a discussion where we were on an offsite and, uh, and Barry uh, Marjoram, who I don't, don't know if Barry came tonight, but Barry had come from Apple. And uh, Barry wanted to talk about our, our mission and our vision. And uh, <laughs> Sam, <laughs> Sam said, you know, our mission is to become profitable before we run out of money. <laughs> What's your problem? <laughs> yeah, and, and so, you know, so software engineering was good, you know, settling on an operating system and doing it was good. Uh, so we, we definitely were focused on that. We, we were not uh, sensitive software artists. We were engineers. In, in my case, we used the IBM Series 1 as the basis of Grid Central. So we had to find IBM Series 1 systems programmers. And there weren't that many of them, and we hired all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so you started in 79. The machine came to market in 82. Were you late? Beta's in 81. Beta's in 81. But was there a period of crash and panic? Um, oh, yeah. What we, was going well, that on was, around? That was daily, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we didn't actually get a building and start hiring people till August of 80. 80. Okay. Yeah, and and so. there were pieces of technology, too, that simply didn't exist, and we had to go develop them, right? The, I mean, the, the display didn't exist when we started. And I mean, it was going to be a vacuum fluorescent display when we started out, and we rapidly figured out that that wasn't going to do it. Yeah. You know, just... Keys were this yeah, tell, tell the story of the keyboard. Um, the, 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 basically, the thin keyboards, the selectric keyboards existed when you guys had started, right? The big thing for a keyboard was to get that selectric, IBM selectric breakaway feel. And the easiest way you got that was a really big plunger with a ball and a tough spring. So we went to Microswitch and Cherry and all the big keyboard manufacturers, and David and I would explain to them what we wanted, and they would just kind of go, oh, you're crazy. <laughs> and luckily, uh, Bill Mugridge found this company in Germany called Rafi that was willing to go continue to invest because they had already started doing some thin work for phones. Uh, so they actually did our keyboard for us. But the power supply, when we started a modem, that, that was modem that was a daily. Yeah. Well, you know, it the, was, the modem, Raquel Vedic built the modem for us, and so we were over there every week. Kim Maxwell, right? Yeah, he was yeah. the VP there. And, you know, we originally described him, we wanted to do a Bell 212A modem in 16, 16 cubic square. inches. And he said, what? It can't be done. <laughs> you know, it can't be done. And then he said, well, you know, maybe it could be done. But every week there was a status update. You know, well, it almost fit in the last design. Almost, you know. <laughs> So what did the modem cost? Do you remember? Ooh, man. That wasn't I, cheap I either. It was yeah, uh, I think it was 325 bucks. It was probably around that, yeah. And was it 250? 250, yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. <laughs> Dave, was that about right? Yeah. It was a it was a 1200 baud modem. Yeah. It finally, yeah. yeah. Which that also And it was, was internal. Yes. Internal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, With telephone support. <laughs> no one had done so, it. Uh, yeah, and so there was there was also. I, the ones I saw over there, do they have phones on them? I don't know if we have. What's the deal? Do, Wait, was the phone there right at the start? Yeah, or? yeah. it was yeah. an option. I think it was a $150 option. That might have been where the 150 came from from the 8,000. <laughs> I don't know. And was it sort of automation? Did you have software automation for calling? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Dialer? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You had an address book? Yeah, yeah we yeah. had yeah, code A for access, you know. We had all our little code keys that we defined, and, you know, we spent God knows how many hours you know, trying to allocate the letters of the alphabet, you know, to the right thing. There were endless <laughs> meetings at Glenn's apartment over that. They'd go on for just days. No, S really should be for. Everybody had an opinion. Yeah, but no, code A was how you, you dialed the phone. 
kind of, you know, you select something. And select we were very, uh, you know, modeless, so, you know, you made a, made a selection and did a command. We, so, so a fair amount, actually, of the, of the Xerox expertise and user interface design um, came, uh, came, came with us. But to, not to the read. mouse. No, well, you know, I mean, that would be another thing you have to carry. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, but you sort of had, you, you were talking about modeless. That was that was Larry Tesler and. Absolutely, Larry Tesler. Yeah, don't mode me in. That was Larry Tesler. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and yeah. But uh, the original UI was menu driven. It, it wasn't. Um, how would it, you? It was not a command line. If that what you yeah. mean. But yeah, yeah there was. A, well, if if we're really lucky, we'll we'll get one of two things. One is that the 1101 that's down there. Will power on, um, and and if that and it, it it powered on 36 hours ago, and then a big pop happened, and smoke came out of that. <laughs> but but it did cool. power it did power on about right right before we uh, started. Um, so either we'll be able to maybe look at the grid user interface, people can come up and look at it afterwards, or we'll be able to test to see if magnesium burns. So <laughs> so stay tuned. You're going to get a show at the end uh, for one of the we'll two things. We'll get Carl things. to fix it. Carl can fix it. Yeah. Did, did you lead the UI? I mean, who is the who gets credit for the UI design? Well, uh, yeah, I led the group that did the UI design. We we um, uh, we had a few people from Xerox uh, come to work in the software team. Uh, Rick, Rick Tiberi. Yeah, Sorry, Rick Tiberi sure. was, uh, was the, the main guy who did a lot of the prototyping the, of the UI design. Uh, Rudy Sherry then um, later here. joined the group. Yeah, Rudy's actually out here tonight. Um, Rick's not here, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, Rick would disappear for, like, days at a time, you know, and then come back with these prototypes, and we'd all go, oh, my God, you know. It was, it was great. And... Um, you know, we again. I I actually have my three lab notebooks, my first three notebooks from the time at Grid, going from the day I started until FCS, basically. But um, yeah, a lot of comments. You know, reading through there about we all like like kind of the file folder metaphor uh, for things, and um, you know, and just a very consistent UI. We had something that the marketing team called leveraged learning, which uh, was uh, way cool because all of the applications, again, we had, you know, we'd spent all this investing time in the um, letters of the alphabet for the commands. And so the idea was that once you learned a set of commands in one application, you could very easily use them in the next application as well. Yeah. So I read somewhere that Ben Rosen was also an an early investor is, mm -hmm. is, is that true? Yeah. And, that, and that even that Esther Dyson had some influence or was around. Yeah, or Esther worked for Release 1.0 for Ben. At the and time. so she was a good critic of ours. She was so that that was the connection. So Ben invested in Compact and in Grid. That's how you be a successful VC. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, why didn't Grid become Compact? Uh, what's 8150 minus 3995? <laughs> <laughs> but you were you were a little bit early. I, I just we I were guess early, I... and I think the other mistake, if you could call it a mistake, um, the other thing that we did we didn't react too fast enough is we didn't get the PC compatibility quick enough because we were already we were already delivering beta units when the PC got announced, okay. so we were already ready to ship. Um, we didn't. When did we finally get PC compatibility? 80, like 85, was 85 was the was the grid case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, but we could run MS DOS well, on we, the Compass. Yeah, yeah but that's sooner than that. Yeah. yeah. That didn't quite. It's just it though. wasn't a, it just wasn't very good, you know, compared yeah. to what we had. I I, th I think most customers when they saw it would prefer uh, did prefer what we had over what you could get on uh, MS DOS at that point. So, but you know, it was a lot more money. The but compact we, was about four thousand dollars. Yeah, it was thirty nine ninety. So, yeah, so it wasn't that. Right. Were you looking down market? I mean, did you have product plans to push down, or was we? Well, I, I mentioned earlier. I think looking back at how you do things today, what we should have done then, which we didn't quite figure out, was we should have forward priced it. So we should have raised more money. We should have gotten everyone to suck it up. We're going to spend more money here. But you know, I wasn't the kind of company we were trying to build at the time. We were trying to get to profitability quickly. So if you look at the cost of goods issues we had, that drove price, and we were just riding the natural curve, whereas the other folks, you know, Compaq, the Luggable, um, was a great product, and it used very inexpensive components compared to what we were buying. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there was a mismatch there. Um, we also were focusing on direct sales. We had a direct sales force. Uh, 
Compaq was focusing on retail sales. We didn't yep. get to business land until 84, 85. Yeah, yeah something yeah. like that. I, I think there's maybe maybe one other point in that um, uh, we also didn't react as quickly to like the plasma screen. I remember when Toshiba came out with that plasma screen, and it was really very, uh, very compelling. And um, you know, we'd always had this idea that we wanted we wanted battery power. We wanted to optimize for battery power. So, you know, those very uh, power hungry screens were just something that, you know, we thought they were important, but they weren't sort of first line for us. Uh, Jeff mentioned sort of the, the, the sort of disconnect between your target audience and the aversion to typing. Uh, you know, Adele, Adele Goldberg, uh, who was at Xerox Park, tells this wonderful story about showing the Alto to uh, Xerox's CEO yes. um, when he was on the West Coast. The next day, he was back east, and a Xerox Park uh, researcher bumped into him, and he said, you know, what did you think? Because it was the first time the top executive had seen it. He turned to him and said, you know, I've never seen a man type so fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, do you think one of your, I mean, how much were you having to plow that ground in, in was, was, that an, was that an actual issue? That, the, 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 that, your, that was definitely an issue. Uh, but I think we found, we were focusing on solution selling before that was cool. Yeah. <laughs> so every sale we did, we specifically had a problem in mind, whether it was Bank of America or the, the Spooks or the Signal Core. We did a lot of software customization. So I, I don't think it, it was, it was certainly an issue to broad acceptance, but so we had to work a lot harder to find a problem to solve. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where people didn't, you know, they got over that quickly because they had a task to do. Yeah. So you also, uh, the, the integrated software that you had, I, I was trying to think, um, the Osborne one came out in, in 81, and it had bundled applications, but they were hardly integrated. It was whoever Adam could talk into letting him bundle the software with. You guys were first at a, at a sort of a Lotus 123 style suite, even though you were missing the, the spreadsheet. Was that? Well, no, no, we, no, had, no we, we had a spreadsheet. spreadsheet. You did first, have a spreadsheet. Oh, yeah, yeah, day, Sorry. yeah, yeah. yeah day, um, you know, when we introduced, we had a text editor, um, a database, spreadsheet, and um, business graphics, uh, and then of course we had the navigator user interface, nice looking, nice looking UI, and it was pretty easy really to transfer data between the applications as well. So you could, um, even though uh, the business graphics uh, was not integrated into the spreadsheet, it was still very easy to just like make a selection and get it over to to grid plot. Did you ever think about unbundling the software from the hardware and? Becoming a, I don't, like, I don't, re I don't remember recall Visicorp that. Remember I mean, Visicorp? No, I don't recall that we ever, we ever actually uh, considered that. Do you, Glenn? I, I don't think so. Well, there was one funny story, which I probably shouldn't tell. <laughs> um, Please do. Intel, <laughs> we, we had done a big selection between the 68,000 and the 8086, and we drank the Intel Kool-Aid. Um, <laughs> Intel arranged a meeting for us with an undisclosed company that wanted to see our software. So I forgot who all was in that meeting, but we go to this meeting. They're all in suits. We show them the software. They're IBM. <laughs> well, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> they had just been to see Gary Kildall. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, that's interesting. So we didn't get it. I mean, we did, it just didn't dawn on us what Intel was trying to achieve. Intel so what, wasn't specific. Oh, that's so that's that famous what, where Gary was flying incident? Yeah, so he didn't meet with But him. then they went up and visited Bill. Right. We were in between. You were in between. That's or, a little bit maybe of we were after, we Maybe we were after Bill. I don't know the exact efficacy, but David House at Intel had set up this meeting for Why us. Why didn't you get IBM. it? Well, it was a bigger issue. I mean, okay. the software was really a big advantage to us. Now, we weren't going to just license the operating system because we were trying to sell an integrated we we were solution. Compete. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. In, in retrospect, it probably was the wrong thing to do, but at the time, it was definitely correct. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this is fascinating. We've been ahead of V8. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, this, you know, um, here were these two toys that IBM was, was I mean, this is, I, I don't know this history anyway. This is a fascinating bit of history. Well, it was, it was, and I don't, I couldn't tell you whether it was before or after the Microsoft meeting. Someone would have to do some forensic work to yeah. figure out all the dates. They didn't tell us about the machine they were building 
you know, so we had no data. All we had was, here's a large company. You can kind of figure out who it is. They want to see your software. Would you show it to them? Yeah. And, you know, then they said, would you have an interest in selling this? And, you know, I think John said, bugger the Brahma. As I remember. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those Britishisms that none of us understood. So. <laughs> So, so I don't uh, even know what that means. It, it, it came with BASIC. Who did the BASIC? Whose BASIC was it? Well, we did our own uh, BASIC. That Which was one, one of the um, one of the other things that we thought uh, would be would be of interest to people. Um, I actually found the original uh, press kit, press release kit, and um, uh, that came out. Actually, it came out in, in uh, April of uh, 1982, and. Um, uh, for all of you who ordered Grid Project, I'm sorry, we, didn't, we never delivered we that. Never deliver that. <laughs> there were also a lot of terminal emulators we never really delivered, but we did deliver some. Uh, but uh, it was, uh, and we were going to also uh, uh, deliver a lot of uh, like Fortran and uh, Pascal and things like that because we did have we this. Did have those. We did have this agreement with uh, Intel, a nice relationship with Intel, as Glenn said, and, and certainly when I joined, there was a uh, 68,000, I guess. And, but it really didn't have any tools to, to do any program development. Uh, and so part of the great things for us was when we got to the, got to the, um, to the uh, Intel platform was they did have a lot of development tools. And I think they were also trying to get into maybe the development tool business. They had the big so, blue boxes. Yeah, and, and so we, um, uh, we kind of struck a deal with them where we helped them with, I think we did a, like a linker or loader. Michael Tibbet yep. uh, did a lot mm -hmm. of things like that. And, um, uh, and as part of that, uh, well, and then they also defined this thing called, I think it was the UDI. It was uh, basically they That's said, right. if you implement this, you will end up with, uh, you'll be able to run all of our development tools, which is, you know, was a great thing. And at that time, as Craig said, we were, we were looking at developing our own operating system. And, so you take that little factoid and then you take Sam's factoid about, you know, becoming profitable before you run out of money. And uh, we, all of us kind of had this group light bulb go on that said, my God, if we implement this UDI thing, that could be our operating system. And gosh, we don't have to, like, think about it, you know, and argue about it for months at a time. So that's really where the original um, operating system came from. And it was multitasking and did all the right stuff. And... We knew we needed well, something. Well, you guys added because their spec was not. Oh, like thank you. Yeah, I think you're right. Thank you. You guys thank did you. that. Yes, good, good memory. They um, have no but, model. but we knew that um, we knew that like CPM was CPM or DR DOS, you know, or whatever. We just were not going to cut it for the applications that we wanted. Um, and you know, we had visions of you know Windows and things like that. And so um, anyway, this this uh, the Intel relationship was uh, was a real good one for us mm -hmm. on on multiple fronts. Before you got into that relationship. Why did you pick the Intel processor over? Was it National? Was that the the Bake Off? No, it was Motorola. Motorola. It was sixty-eight thousand. Right. So yeah. what? Why did you pick Intel? Um, they were a lot Intel closer than Motorola. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, actually, you know, when I interviewed at, at Grid, Glenn and I had this conversation, and <laughs> are we moving? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is everybody's seat belt fastened to their tray table? Right. Right? That's right. So anyway, Glenn, Glenn, uh, Glenn said, well, we started with a 68,000, and we actually, actually built something, as yeah. I recall. Yeah. And Glenn said, all it did was get hot, That's because right. actually there wasn't any code to run on it. And as an operating system developer, I would have really preferred the 68,000 yeah. architecture. That was a lot more pleasant than dealing with what Intel had come up with. Segments. You know? Segments. I mean, they've been driving 8-bit microprocessors into 64 bits for their whole history now, <laughs> and it shows. But you know, the, <laughs> Intel, you, know, you may know the name John Crawford. Sure. Uh, John and I went to school together, and so we, were, we would you know, talk now and then. And he was working on the Pascal compiler and UDI and all of that stuff. And he basically said, look, we're going to have all this stuff that goes with this chip. So if you buy it, you're done. Of course, you have to buy the $20,000 big blue intellect development system to get it all, which we did. Uh, but we, were, we had a big head start by going with Intel. Okay. Well, we should um, open this up to the audience. But I want to ask about the end game a little bit. What, you know, what happened at the end? Were, were you, any of you or all of you still there in 88? Did, uh, um, sure. Yeah, I was there when Tandy uh, acquired the company. So they what drove you into the arms of Tandy, and do you know the, the, the final history? Well, um, you know, I think the, some of the advantages that we thought we would get from Tandy was that... Retail. Uh, well, retail. Um, but also, I think it was, um, you know, our volumes were always really low, 
And so it was very difficult for us to get any real cost advantages. So we thought by going with Tandy that, um, you know, with the amount of components and things that they bought, that we would be able to drive the price down. And that was, that was a really big thing for us. And, of course, Tandy thought that they would be getting a, um, you know, a direct sales force. Uh, so we so both wanted what the, each, uh, what the yeah. other person had. Which yeah. 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 And did it did it have a life of note at Tandy? How did it do after? I mean, it sort of fell off my radar. And yeah, you know, I sort of left after the Tandy acquisition, but I think the the uh, grid name stayed on for uh, through while well, Tandy had it, and then the Tandy I AST think sold it to AST. AST. It was a government yeah. brand. Yeah, and there were grid retail stores for a while too. I don't know how many people know that. In the Tandy incarnation, or uh, it was just, uh, no, just before, before that. Okay, where? So, well, there was one near where I was living in Massachusetts, in Wellesley. So, interesting. Okay. Actually, bef before you go on, there's one thing I have yeah. to do here. Oh, yeah. Um, this is important. Well, I have to confess, um, 25 years ago, I borrowed a cable from you. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to return it. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. This is, uh, this is actually a, a genuine GPIB cable. And I'm sh I think there's a museum that might want one of these. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we go with you first? You can identify yourself. Oh, uh, my name is Salam Ismail. I'm with Vintage Tech. Um, so I have three quick questions. Uh, do you remember what the orig original production run was for the very first model? Um, what was the profit margin at the time? And finally, I have a kind of a geek question about the difference between the 1100 model and 1101 model, or if the 1100 actually was a model? The, the, going backwards, there never was an 1100. That was just kind of the marketing generic term. So, so 1101 was the, the unit. Okay. Um, the projections, by volume you mean? The, you yeah, how many were units made? built? Uh, production. Produ first production. And market. then what was the profit margin in each? Well, the profit margin was pretty darn good. That was one of our problems. <laughs> uh, you know, our net profit, I mean, our, you know, I'm sorry, gross profit, our net profit was, of course, negative <laughs> um, for a while. The original production run, Paul would probably remember this, we were aiming for 3,000 for the first six months, which I believe we met. All right, thanks. And then, you know, Glenn mentioned the 3X uh, pricing. That was pretty much how we did everything. There was only one exception to that. When we were designing GridLink, which was our LAN, there was a terminating resistor that was required. And the resistor had a cost to us of, I think, 35 cents. So I wrote it down as 95 cents as the price. And Glenn said, you can't charge 95 cents for something. And I said, well, what should we make it? And Glenn said, charge eight bucks. <laughs> so that was, that was actually the highest margin product we ever sold. <laughs> So we'll go back and forth. Your turn next. Hi, uh, John Green. Uh, I have an interest in uh, people doing proprietary or single vendor operating systems. Back in the late 60s and 1970, that was the way to do it. So the 90 or so mini computer companies each had their own. And I'm aware of some of the last of the uh, proprietary operating systems, like Alexi's MBOS and uh, Apollo's Aegis Domain, and I guess yours. So given that Unix is coming on strong and the IBM, uh, I'm sorry, um, MS-DOS is coming on strong, do you have any comments about the problems that you had of being one of the last vendors ever to have a proprietary operating system? Oh, well, it was Apple. There was not <laughs> oh, well, yeah. obviously, Apple was, obviously Apple was after you, but I mean, from your experience in, in uh, 81, 82. Well, um, gosh, you know, I think one of the things that we realized was that really in order to grow in the portable marketplace, we needed to have a PC-compatible machine. And that was the, the big push behind the grid case, which is, I think, introduced in uh, 1985. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, uh, but on that, uh, we could also run the grid applications. But, you know, frankly, the, the market was really just going much more towards uh, uh, towards uh, the DOS applications. And so, um, you know, you could see that there was going to be a, a, a demise or a waning interest in the, in, in the grid operating system and the applications. So. Okay. But if you look at when we started, MS-DOS didn't even exist yet that True. we knew about when we started. So It was CPM or Yeah, or DR DOS, yeah. You know, interestingly, though, uh, on Grid Central, we use something called RPS, 
which stood for real-time programming system, but others thought it stood for real piece of, and, and it was, <laughs> that's actually how the IBM systems engineer described it to me when I, so as it turns out, they had developed a, an implementation of version seven of Unix. And we actually had that running, and we were gonna make Grid Central based on that. But ultimately, it turned out to be too much of a port. So for a follow-up follow question, uh, like when Apollo did the Regis domain, and then Sun, Sun came out of nowhere with Unix, they had a lot of resistance inside the company because the people who had done Aegis Domain knew it was better than Unix and had, had uh, uh, you know, intellectual property invested in it. They had their egos invested in it. So if I believe you, or I mean, if I heard what I think you said, you guys had no egos. You were willing to abandon your system trivially. Well, no, there was that. There was. <laughs> Sorry. You're, you're very kind. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had a lot of egos. And in fact, you know, it's, uh, yes, there were a lot of egos involved in it. But at some point in time, you have to, you know, get on with, you know, the direction of the company. On the side. Uh, yes, my name is John Goschel, and I was a user. Uh, not of the grid, and I'll explain why in a second. Uh, I was a university professor, and we, we beta tested the IBM 5100, we beta tested the HP 9845, and we were going to buy a grid, but we ran out of grant, mo grant money, so I, I stuck it out for a while and bought a, a, a compact. By the way, they were $3,300 when they first came out, the compact. I, I, we, we had these machines before they were on the market. I ordered a compact by putting a $330 check in an envelope and sticking it in the cash drawer of the computer land said, well, you can't order it yet, but <laughs> as soon as you can. But uh, I'd like to make a comment. I think the, the problem with, uh, just to follow up on really the, the comment that he was making, you guys were too smart for your own good. Uh, the team that invented the 5100 was a, it, although the company wasn't like your company, the team was like your team. We met some of the people that were in that team. Yeah, the team that nice. developed the 9845 was like your team. They were capable of doing everything all at one time. So they, they, they invented their own systems, so they were completely self-contained. So I think in some ways the seeds of the end of your company were sown in the same manner as the end of the 5100 and the 9845. The grid was... And you guys were so far ahead of your time that you you couldn't wait for the interactive situation of having open software and that kind of thing. So I think it's just a comment that you, it's uh, in some ways you were too smart for your own good, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. And we were too early. <laughs> changing too. Yeah. Uh, Eugene, yeah. Eugene, yeah. I'm the NASA technical administrator, or actually the liaison to the museum, and. Um, the last time actually I interacted with grids, I uploaded email to a friend of mine in the space shuttle when she was orbiting in the 90s. And I used actually a, a compass down in the Antarctic at about latitude 83 in the Ross Ice Sheet. Turner, don't leave, whatever you do. <laughs> I went to school with Dave and um, a bunch of other friends. Back in the uh, 80s, you guys haven't mentioned actually your initial market, which uh, in, in the early 80s, I know like uh, convex downstairs. You guys targeted the oil market, as I, as I seem to recall. That was, we had an oil patch sales force. Right, specifically. And so anyways, Dave started to work with you guys, and I went and visited him back in when you guys were in Garcia. Turned out we were all, a bunch of us went to school together down in, in Santa Barbara. I had another friend from Santa Barbara whose family was getting into the oil industry. They built the largest building, the Bank of America Tower in, in, in San Francisco. So they were thinking about buying computers for their, their oil company, which was a substantial kind of investment at the time. So I went to Dave, and I got th those brochures that you guys had to take up to, to show my friend Ed, his mom, his stepfather. And unbeknownst to us, um, another classmate of ours from a different department at Santa Barbara went to my friend Ed and said, no, you don't want to get this, this grid compass thing. I'm working this on this project at Apple called Macintosh. <laughs> and uh, so Patty was her name. She's one of the, of the 19 names on the inside. And unfortunately, that's actually a case where you guys sort of lost sales to other competitors, even though this was before Steve Jobs did the, uh, the 1984 announcement. So I think the one thing is if you could say something about the fact that you guys had decided to target the oil market specifically, you might detail, I think, a little bit about 
that part of Greek history. And Dave, let's talk after this. We had about eight different target markets. Oil was just one of them. Jeff Goodfellow. Hi, my name is Jeff Goodfellow, and I, like John, had a serious case of grid lust when the $10,000 products came out. And I bought my first grid in 1986 when I left SRI after being there for 12 years. And I bought it from a leasing company whose name I can't remember. It has something leasing in its name. It was based on Campus Drive in San Mateo. And they basically let these things go for fire sale prices. And I bought one because I hated moving parts. I had a leased 9600 baud line to a PDP-10 running 10x at SRI from my house. And the concept of having to back up all my files was just absolutely abhorrent. So I loved the concept of Grid Central. And the two things that I remember about Grid Central was, I think it actually was, maybe Mr. Grid Central can talk about this, was it had this concept of tokens, is that you could buy software packages. The grid was going to create an online software marketplace, and you could buy software electronically, and you would just add a token to your account, and then you could downline load the... That's how you'd get the applications. Right, right, the new application. And that's something that was totally, everyone like, I remember when, before we had the web browser, there were like these e-stores and things like that. Well, I remember back in 1986 that grid actually allowed you to buy software online. As Jeff Hawkins mentioned earlier, we did invent the Internet at grid, so... Was Al Gore on your payroll? Al Gore was a consultant. Excellent. So why didn't you patent that token thing? I think we did. Find that one. And then the second part of my question was, when Jeff was earlier talking about like marketing missteps and things like that, I was always curious about the executives who liked to be able to, once they did their proprietary, whatever they did, they could take their floppy disk out of their computer and put it in their safe, versus trusting that over the telephone line to a computer that was sitting on a fault line in California. We did eventually sell a floppy disk drive and a hard drive, floppy drive combination. I remember that because I think I was also the first person, the consumer actually, to buy a grid server and wire their household with it. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Hi, I'm Bob Stewart. My first computer, personal computer, was a Mitzelter, and the cost of that as a kit was $395. So factor of 20 less than your price, which is why I never owned a grid. But I do feel I have to show this to the audience, which I bought, I believe, about 1975, and it's the Hewlett Packard 75, which is a laptop computer, and I used it on my laptop. It has a keyboard, an LCD display, and most important to me was the fine basic it had, which would handle complex variables. And at the time I was doing optical design, and the HUD on the head-up display on the F-14, the F-16, and the F-18 were actually designed partially on... But just think of how effective you could have been if you'd had one of ours. Did your basic have complex variables? Yes, it did. No, I don't think so. I don't think you were quite the market we were aiming for with our basic. Depending on how many you want to buy, we could do that. Why don't you see me afterwards? We'll talk. There's one thing I'd like to ask you, since I'm a chip guy, is which chip did you use, the 8086? Yes. And an 8087. Optional. What was the clock rate? 16 megahertz. 15 megahertz. 16. And how many clocks per instruction? Intel says. Intel has been lying about that forever. Four, five, ten? Four or five. I'd play four. Yeah. So it's a far cry from the Pentium 4 today. 
Thank you. Thank you for sharing the HP. Yeah, thank you. On, on this side. Uh, Ken Delaney. And uh, I, I thought it would be good for all of you to share not only what you did in terms of just the compass, but all the other things that GRID created, you know, throughout its lifetime. And I think that's, that's just as significant as the la first laptop itself. So, well, do you have the grid, uh, the tablet with the pad? Uh, I have one of them, yeah. Whichever one you had. Yeah, you might want to take but a look I, at this. So, this but, is I, but I think there are just so many other things that we accomplished there that you might want to share. Yeah, the grid, the tablet PC, as Microsoft now calls it. We call it the convertible. Clearly, we were not good at marketing. Um, grid pad was probably neck and neck with Newton as the, who actually got out first. Um, you know, and, and you asked and you did, about the culture, and that, I think what, what Ken just mentioned really defined the culture. The culture was one of innovation. If it's new and different and may have some opportunities in the market, we'll try it. We'll do it. And, you know, the, building the first laptop was a real gamble. I mean, nobody really knew if these things were going to sell, but ultimately they did sell. They sell under lots of other labels and brands now. I remember when I interviewed at Grid, I, I actually got involved with this by calling John Ellenby at his house. I'd heard that he and Gene Amdahl were going to start a new company, and I never heard of John Ellenby, but I sure had heard of <laughs> Gene Amdahl. So a anyway, we got to talking about this, and it just suddenly occurred to me that this really was going to be the future. This is something that everybody was eventually going to have, and it was just great to be associated with it, even if we didn't make a zillion dollars. We made some. It was not a crash and burn. This company was successful. John Wharton. Uh, John Wharton. Um, I'm intrigued. I remember long ago hearing stories about how NASA had adopted this for use on the shuttle. Uh, there was something about the use of the grid allowed them to not have to dink with the main computer on the, you know, the navigation computer and so forth, and if, if you might elaborate on that. Also, how did NASA feel about putting a flammable metal appliance <laughs> on board a shuttle they, platform? They didn't have any problems with that once we got the fan in there. Uh, I, I didn't talk about it on the slide because I was trying to get through them quickly. Can I, I, can, can I take this one? Sure. Um, so they put the fan in it so it could cool itself because, you know, conduction didn't work in space, which was kind of a, oh, huh, never thought about that. But then they covered the thing in Velcro, <laughs> which then caused other problems. The, the applications they ran were, were really interesting. They took the modem out of the grid, and Rockwell International built a board that was the same size that interfaced the grid to the shuttle bus. So the grid could talk to all of the gear on the shuttle. The first application they did was a thing called World Map, which Navigation. just gave the astronauts where they were. Yeah. And, and we were talking to, to John Crippen and John Young and some of the astronauts when we were first showing it to them, and we couldn't believe that they had no idea where they were. They would look out the window. <laughs> And, and so we did this piece of software that gave them the same display they had on the ground. Um, the next thing was this thing called Malprox, because the grid was seeing everything that was happening on the shuttle. It would already know that alarms went off. And so they would, if an alarm went off, they would type a three-digit number on the grid, and it would immediately step them through a flow chart to find out what the problem was. And then they got into lots of different applications. Grids were used to launch virtually every satellite off the shuttle from, I think, about 84 to 97. So it would actually have the launch sequence software in it. And then they finally got to things which were called quality of life applications, which was amazing, which was calendar scheduling for the astronauts. <laughs> so did they you, scheduled their time in seven-minute increments. Did you mention the name that they called the... Oh, Spock. Yeah. Which is the shuttle portable, uh, portable onboard, onboard computer. computer. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and that, I think, at least the last time I was at the um, uh, Smithsonian, the National Air and Space Museum, uh, it's it's there and it's and it's got the Spock display on it. Yeah, it's still running. Yeah. I don't think they ever said anything about flammability or anything like that. Magnesium is a really high flash point. Yeah. So if it's on fire, then. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there's one. I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll tell one quick story. It's a little interesting and sad. In the Challenger disaster, the grids were recovered, and they still worked, oh. which is amazing. Yeah. Dan Henderson. Glenn said earlier that there was a good story about the move from Freedom Circle, maybe. Oh, it's Garcia. Okay, I'll try to tell this one really quickly. Barry Marjoram was our marketing person, and he had a marketing person's mind. He's very good at it. So he decided we should change the name of the street from Garcia Way to Compass Way. So we went to the <laughs> this city. This is great. 
We went to the city, and the city said, oh, no problem. All you've got to do is get all the people on the street to agree to change the name. So we thought, well, that's easy. Barry can sell ice cubes to Eskimos. <laughs> so Barry and I get out the phone book, and we start at the end of the street, and we just start calling people. And Barry's tactic was to tell everyone, you are my last call. <laughs> Everyone has agreed to do this. We'll pay to change your letterhead. Would you mind if we change the name of the street? And so we're going, everyone's saying, oh, well, all right, well, you know, you know, and we say, we're going to pay all your expenses, you know, letterhead, business cards, whatever. So we're marching down the book. We're, we're like just two phone calls or three phone calls from being done. And it's going, right on, Barry. And so we pick up the last, the, this next call, and the guy starts laughing, just busting out laughing on the phone. And he goes, you mean to tell me you got old man Garcia to agree to change the name of the street? <laughs> <laughs> we started at the wrong end of the street. <laughs> <laughs> so it is still called Garcia Way to this day. Along with the uh, GRID, one of its most famous places being on the space shuttle, wasn't another one of GRID's most fa famous roles as being the president's football? That's the nuclear the, the, weapons the, the, device? Well, it oh, was, oh, it oh. definitely was on Air Force One. Yeah. So. yeah. I, I also happen to have Jim Opfer as a customer and a yeah. board member of my company that I founded. So yeah. uh, we, we have that in, in common. And Jim once told me, and yes, now it's public because he used to be the CIO of the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, which builds all the spy satellites. It, n n now, now that he can talk about that, he once told me that, that you know, the football that the president, that the, the bag carrier, the Secret yes. Service man carried you know, behind the president wherever he went, went was in fact a grid, a grid. compass yeah. la you know, laptop that actually had all the nuclear launch boats in it. We yeah. can't confirm or deny <laughs> <laughs> Well, there, actually, there was another interesting aspect of that, which was uh, it allowed the Secretary of Defense actually to leave Washington, because up until that time, right, he always needed to be in constant contact with his control center, and he couldn't do that. And when they actually got the grid compass into his office, he could he actually could now leave Washington and go any place that he wanted to. So which you could argue is For good better or for ill. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Two questions. Uh, can you talk about the financing behind grid? and on a completely different tack. Uh, can you talk about the impact or lack thereof of the DG1, the Data General 1? Greg, you want to take that? Well, you know, the DG1 was arguably developed at roughly the same time as the Compass. We, we had later. no internal knowledge of that. I had heard inklings of it when I was uh, at Data General, but I didn't know any details. All I heard was portable computer. Uh, but, you know, there really was no competition with the DG1. It was made out of plastic. It had a two-to-one contrast ratio. Uh, it was very primitive by comparison. It cost a lot less. Uh, another one at the same time, though, was uh, Gallivan. Gallivan? Gallivan. Gallivan. Yeah. which they have one in, uh, of in the museum here. Oh, yeah. And that we really looked at more seriously as a potential competitor. But even that was just not in our league, I, I don't yeah. think. As far as the financing, I, Glenn would probably know that. Um, our, our first round of funding was seed funding uh, from folks like Ray Williams and Gene Amdahl and about five other great folks that were great advisors to us. Um, our first venture funding was in August of 80, um, and the lead investor there was Institutional Venture Partners, Reed Dennis, who um, spoke here not too long ago. That was a great talk. And we had Citicorp Ventures and Mayfield, uh, Mayfield Fund. Mm -hmm. And that was the three original investors. We did another round exactly a year later. This is amazing. Two and a half million dollars was the first round. <laughs> and three and a half million dollars was the second round. And we thought we were going overboard. <laughs> so six million, six million dollars to bring it to market? Yeah. Yeah. And barely, I mean, if you look at when the, the work actually started was when we moved into the building in August 80. Our venture requirement was we had to have 10 working machines on August 31st, 1981. So we did all this yep. in a year. Yep. And we lived to tell about it. That's right. <laughs> you know, salaries were a lot lower back then, and I guess we should mention nobody had a cubicle bigger than oh, six by six. Six by six, yeah. you got it. So That's in what fact, I think we violated the fire yeah. codes, because I remember once the fire marshal showed up, and Glenn was running through the building, and he's saying, go out the back, go out the back. <laughs> <laughs> These are just storage. <laughs> 
final? We're reaching 8.30, but a final question. I'm Raj Shah, another freedom fighter. You're Raj. Really nice to hear you guys. A lot of memories have come back. Same here, Raj. Yes, great to see you. Well, Craig, you brought me into great, so thanks to you. I had fun six years there. But I think all of you were a little too modest about how much we did in software. And I remember one meeting we had. There was an investor in the building. I think, Carol, you and I and probably Glenn in the room, he said, you guys have done, you have one or two engineers working on grid ride, grid file, grid plan, you know, all of that. We see companies that do what one or two engineers are doing. And I think that's really true. I mean, we had grid plan, which was, you know, was, I think, as good as what was VisiCalc in those days, or one to three wasn't quite around. Grid file was a pretty good database. In our mail system, we did, had, you know, features like offline mail that showed up in Outlook just three years ago. We had that in 88. Right, right. No, we could, you know, sit on flights and, you know, with that small battery pack, read our mail and write our mail, you know, in 88. But Carol knew the way to keep software small was not have many people work on it. Well, it was, yeah, I mean, I'm still astounded. And, in fact, actually Jeff Hawkins told me a story a few days ago about how the grid experience influenced him when he was starting Palm, you know, and they were talking about, you know, they needed big processors and lots of memory and stuff like that for the operating system. And he says, no, you know, we had a multitasking operating system that ran on 80, you know, small amounts of stuff. When I was young. Yeah. But it really was phenomenal. I mean, all the software that we actually did develop and the small amount of resources it actually took to run the thing. And it had, you know, decent performance and you could do, you could just really do a lot of good stuff. I have a small story to share. I took my first trip to India while I was at GRID. I took a GRID with me. And, you know, those days, you know, this is 83 time frame. I had to pay the customs guy about, I think, equivalent to one lakh rupees. So that was $4,000 of a bond from a bank. It took me three days to get the machine out of customs. But when I showed it to all the big guys, the Tatas and the Wipros, the first comment there was, this GRID is too small. People won't pay this much money for a small screen. Actually, just one, yeah, one quick uh, little anecdote, Raj, that you, uh, you reminded me of was that, you know, everything was so secret for GRID in terms of what we were doing and just, God, we couldn't talk, we couldn't talk and everything. And finally, and Bob Wolf was, um, I, don't remember, I don't know if Bob managed to make it here tonight, but hey, there he is. But uh, you'll, I hope you'll forgive me for telling this, Bob, but, but Bob, um, Bob got married. Uh, between the time he joined GRID and between the time we announced the product. And so we had this big laugh that on his wedding night he'd taken a GRID compass with him and he could finally show his wife what, what he's doing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the rest, the rest of it was that she was going to say, wow, that's the smallest one. I <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think... Um, um, Andy made a good suggestion. I think it'll be good for all the grid employees here to stand. Oh, oh excellent idea. idea. Yeah. Terrific. Congratulations to you all. And my favorite Ron Shaw story. There's a lot of them. But, uh, <laughs> All of, the, all of the key decisions were made on a Saturday morning. I mean, it was a seven-day-a-week kind of thing, obviously. But Saturday morning, we would all come into work, and we'd have design reviews. And so everybody would, on occasion anyway, somebody would bring something to eat. So we walk in one morning. I gave Glenn a ride in, and we're sniffing the air. And, what does that smell like to you? And it turns out Raj had brought in this huge dish of yes. curry for breakfast. <laughs> now, I love curry. This was great, but it was not a big seller that day. <laughs> So it's 8.30. Uh, why don't we give our panel a, a hand? Great yeah. story. Yeah. Thank you. John, 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 let me just say that thank you, thank you very much for all your encouragement and stimulation this evening. Thanks very much. And, it's really, it's really, really exciting to see such a team come together and make history. And it, clearly, it had been made. And it's really a pleasure to have you here at the Computer History Museum. So thank you very much. And for each of you participants tonight, we got a little small token of appreciation. But again, thank you so much. Hope you had a wonderful time. And thank each and every one of you and those that participated in all this development. Thanks.